Welcome to the Apron Academy. This video is specially designed for the dietitian in training, also known as the RD to be. In this video, we're going to be talking about choline. So this one's kind of interesting in that it's not really a vitamin, but it's often grouped with um, a lot of the B vitamins. So let me go ahead and show you the forms. So this here is our free choline. It is a water-soluble form, and as I mentioned this, I uh, do want to say choline is very interesting. It can act as a water-soluble water vitamin and as a fat-soluble vitamin, so it kind of plays both sides. So again, this free choline works as a water-soluble form. If we look at this big molecule but just cut off right here, then that is phosphocholine. That's also a water-soluble form. And then if we add this part, then that is glycerophosphocholine. That's also a water-soluble form. Now, if we take this large molecule, the whole thing is phosphatidylcholine. That is our main form. Um, it's fat-soluble, and it's located in the membranes. And... Um, this, like I mentioned, it's our main form. It's used for membrane biogenesis, bioformation, VLDL synthesis, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, but I'll mention absorption in just a second, but it is absorbed in lysophosphatidylcholine, so that's just one of these tails um, as the molecule. So phosphatidylcholine it's digested by phospholipase A2 as this lysophosphatidylcholine. Um, with the free choline, it has high bioavailability, and then the phosphatidylcholine is available dependent on our food sources and some other unknown factors. So some of those food sources, plants and animals, specifically like chicken, pork, and beef, so let's talk about the absorption. Again, that fat absorption is when the lysophosphatidylcholine um, with that one fatty acid tail is absorbed and then it is reacylated to that phosphatidylcholine, the larger uh, molecule, and incorporated into the chylomicron, micron um, and then lymph and then it goes on like fat soluble absorption that we normally see and if you do have questions about the fat soluble absorption i encourage you to watch my other fat soluble vitamin videos um, and then choline also is absorbed through a water soluble absorption so it's absorbed via a sodium dependent carrier mediated transport system or passive diffusion um, then it's able to enter into the enterocyte as free choline and then it's oxidized to betaine. So we'll talk about betaine a little bit later. And then I also put this bonus absorption that is not a scientific term, but I wanted to mention that any unabsorbed choline that's left in the gut is metabolized by the gut bacteria into methylamines. So when we have um, excessive excretion of trimethylamine, one of those methylamines, um, it's the cause of a fishy odor with large doses of choline. Um, so because there are all these different um, differences in absorption and transport, transport between uh, you know, it's water-soluble and fat-soluble functions, and choline functions, it's both. It causes differences in the distribution and the metabolic fate, or where it ends up and goes. So now, I do want to talk about our transport system, how it gets in the body. Choline is hydrophilic, a hydrophilic cation that needs a transport mechanism. So we do have two. One is a high affinity transporter um, where this functions is um, with acetylcholine synthesis in our nerve terminals. So I'll 
show you that a little bit later. Um, and then our low affinity transporter primarily functions in phospholipid synthesis in our cell membranes. So we have two pathways of synthesis. This first one is our phosphatidylcholine via CDP choline pathway. So this is the pathway. Um, we have our free choline. It is transported. Um, and then uh, it's transported via a low affinity transporter. And it's able to get phosphorylated. So that's what this P choline stands for. It's phosphorylated and then it's able to travel into the nucleus. And then we add on the CDP choline onto this um, molecule. And that CDP choline is um, enriched. It's able to cause this um, phosphatidylcholine um, to be enri enriched in linoleic acid. So the CDP choline binds to this DAG enzyme and then the phosphatidylcholine is made. So this whole pathway is the default pathway. This is primarily how phosphatidylcholine choline is um, synthesized. But we do have another synthesis pathway, the PEMT pathway. Um, so it can get in a similar way. We have our free choline, the low affinity transporter, it gets into the cell, then can go into the mitochondria, change into betaine, and then we have the betaine. Otherwise, we do have betaine. It will go in through a transporter. Either way, we end up with betaine in our liver cell. So um, betaine is a great methyl donor. So it is able to hand off its methyl group to homocysteine. Um, this may look familiar. And then we get methionine. So methionine goes into our PMT uh, pathway and sequentially builds um, to the phosphatidyl choline by handing off the methyl groups. That's just what's happening here. Hand off, hand off, hand off, phosphatidyl choline. This is all inside the endoplasmic reticulum. So this whole pathway, the PMT-derived phosphatidylcholine, is enriched in long-chain poly, polyunsaturated fatty acids, specifically DHA, which is important for brain development of a baby during pregnancy. Um, so this specific pathway is hormone-driven. Um, many of the enzymes that play a role in this pathway are driven by estrogen so it and we ask ourselves why well if we if the PMT derived um, phosphatidylcholine is enriched in those um, DHAs that are important for brain development in pregnancy then we wouldn't need that in women but when uh, women go through menopause, we typically don't use this um, pathway because it's, it's not needed. So our newly, um, in either pathway, when phosphatidylcholine is um, synthesized, then it is incorporated into VLDL. So now I want to talk about the function. It has a lot of functions. Um, this first one is kind of a big one. Um, it plays a role with acetylcholine. This, um, it uses a high affinity transport system. And um, that high affinity is specific to um, neurons. So it goes, this is our little neuron guy. Um, and gets built into the phosphatidylcholine. So, um, now let's see. Okay, I kind of just want to talk out this um, whole dilly-do. So, 
I kind of have um, this pink is a little different. So the phosphatidylcholine is um, built into our cell membrane. It functions there. It's stored in the membranes, but it can be used if needed. It uses this um, low affinity transporter, but this is kind of this isn't this function that we're talking about. I did want to just show that, that it is in the membrane, um, but this is kind of where we're at. So the choline, um, we use acetylcholine, or acetyl-CoA, we get acetylcholine. Um, these are these little blue dot things. So it is incorporated into the vesicles in the presynaptic neuron. And then it is to be released into the synaptic cleft, which then transmits a signal. So um, acetylcholine, this, all these blue things, um, is our chief neurotransmitter in our central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. So in order for it to uh, you know, be created and get, even get to this point. We need choline, so very, very important. Um, when it's done, acetylcholine um, reacts with this guy, this um, acetylcholine esterase, which terminates the acetylcholine signal um, by hydrolyzing acetylcholine to get acetate and choline, goes back into this high affinity transporter, and then we have the choline and can kind of keep going. So now we do have other functions, and I know that that's a lot, but um, really they're pretty, they're complex in our body, but they're simple to know. So these are some of the other physiological functions. We have membrane formation. So honestly, this is foundational. This membrane formation um, goes back to how this is being built into uh, the membrane. That was just showing that. Um, so phosphatidylcholine is our main constituent of our membranes, and it is required during cell division. So that's the main um, idea, but in all these other functions, we're going to see how membrane formation is just crucial with choline. So then this third function is bile formation. Um, so our bile salts can damage our lining, but phosphatidylcholine uh, uh, protects hepatocytes and our bile duct epithelial cells. So what is it doing? It's protecting that lining. Um, or the membranes, and then it's reabsorbed into our chylomicrons. This fourth function, VLDL biosynthesis and secretion, it, um, phosphatidylcholine is our main lipid in our monolayer surrounding the VLDL. So if we do not have VLDL, um, we often see fatty liver um, because we can't transport out the fat with our VLDL. So without choline, uh, without phosphatidylcholine, no VLDL, VLDL is made. So fat is basically stuck in the liver, causing that fatty liver. Fifth, we have this secret, secretory pathway. Um, so the Golgi also need phosphatidylcholine because the Golgi is basically budding off of the membranes for um, vesicular transport. So again, it plays a role with the membranes. Um, next we have brain development and cognition. So the membranes of our nervous system um, of the nervous system epigenetic changes when we don't have enough choline in utero. So as, as the brain is developing in utero, um, the baby needs um, choline in order to um, correctly develop um, 
the membranes in our nervous system. So then now methyl group donors, we saw that with the homocysteine. Um, choline is um, a methyl source in the liver and the kidneys, also required for a lot of um, prenatal programming. Eighth is the cell lining. Um, so the membrane phosphatidylcholine releases DAG enzyme, which can be cleaved off and used um, as signaling molecules. And then finally, osmolite. Um, so betaine, um, we've mentioned that before, and glycophosphocholine, that was um, the kind of medium-sized molecule of phosphatidylcholine without the fatty acid tails. Um, those are both osmolites, and they protect against damage caused by hyperosmolality. So a lot of functions for choline, but kind of it all goes back to um, acetylcholine, creating acetylcholine, and many of these just fall under membrane uh, formation. But it is important to know each way how choline is affected or works. But now what happens if I don't have enough? So I mentioned um, with our VLDL biosynthesis, if we don't have the choline making the VLDL, um, allowing the fat to leave, then we um, end up with a fatty liver. So that um, is something that happens if we don't have enough choline. We also have just liver dysfunction because there's often leakage or oxidative DNA damage and our liver enzymes in blood um, or liver enzymes are in the blood because of lost integrity of that membrane. And we also see birth defects. Um, there's a risk of neural tube defects. So that was similar to folate, um, but it's the same with choline. Um, we have risk of cancer, specifically breast cancer and colorectal um, cancer in women. And then we also have an increased risk of Alzheimer's. So there's a decrease in that acetylcholine synthesis. Uh, the neurotransmitters uh, or synaptic pathways are not um, functioning like they should. But it is interesting that um, studies have shown that the CDP choline, which is one of those intermediate products, um, those supplements can help improve memory and behavior in Alzheimer's patients. So that is interesting. Um, and then also many um, studies now, they're looking into treatment with betaine to impact that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease to see if that would help. Um, yeah. That's pretty much all I wanted to talk about, but uh, choline, you don't hear a whole lot about it. It's kind of um, in the middle of the, um, I guess, in between the fatty, um, what am I trying to say? The fat-soluble vitamins and the water-soluble vitamins kind of floats in between, but there's so many functions for choline, so important. If you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe and join me next time.